Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities on Our Own Devices. I'm Jean Messier, and today we are having a look at a fascinating piece of scientific apparatus courtesy of 13-year-old me. This rather nondescript looking box here is called a cloud chamber, and I built this in the eighth grade as part of my science fair project. And while this might look very crude, indeed it's built from an aquarium covered in construction paper, this device actually allows you to visualize the paths of subatomic particles, such as cosmic rays coming from space or the emanations of radioactive particles. And since this is a rather large device that takes up most of the frame here, I'm going to set this aside for the rest of the video. So the cloud chamber was invented in 1911, not by a particle physicist, interestingly enough, but rather a Scottish meteorologist named Charles Wilson. And in the 1890s, Wilson was stationed at a meteorological observatory atop Ben Nevis, which is the tallest mountain in Scotland and in the United Kingdom. And there he became fascinated with a phenomenon known as the Brocken Spectre. And the Brocken Spectre occurs when the meteorological conditions and the angle of the sun are just right. And it takes the form of a giant shadow of the mountain projected onto a low-lying cloud surrounded by a rainbow halo known as a glory. And later, Wilson started constructing a chamber that would allow him to create his own clouds in the laboratory and study the formation of clouds and the formation of optical phenomenon like the Brocken Spectre. And this was based off an earlier device known as the Aitken counter. And this was designed to measure the concentration of dust particles in the air. So in order to form a cloud, in order for the droplets of moisture to form from water vapor, you need something called a nucleation site. And this can be anything. This can be a speck of dust, a grain of pollen, a bit of hair, anything for the water to condense around. And so in the Aitken detector, you would introduce a sample of air into a chamber, and then you would adiabatically cool it. You would expand the air so that the air became super saturated, and the water vapor would condense around these nucleation sites. And if you took a picture and you counted all of these nucleation sites, it would give you a good estimate of the dust concentration in the air. And Wilson's device was very similar. He had a cylindrical chamber with a sliding piston at the bottom, and this was connected to a flask out of which the air had been pumped. And so to create a cloud, you would open a valve between the evacuated chamber and the piston. The piston would drop, it would adiabatically cool and expand the air, and then the cloud would form. But instead of using ambient air like in the Aitken counter, Wilson used filtered air and he meticulously cleaned out the inside of the chamber to eliminate all nucleation sites so that he could introduce his own in various cloud making experiments. But he immediately ran into something of a roadblock because no matter how well he cleaned the inside of the chamber, no matter how thoroughly he filtered the air, clouds continued to form when he depressurized the chamber. And after a lot of trial and error, he finally realized that this wasn't being caused by some stray bit of dust that he had somehow missed, but rather by charged particles, such as cosmic rays, streaming through the chamber. And what was happening was that as these particles passed through the chamber, they would ionize this supersaturated gas along their path, and then the rest of the gas would condense around the path, creating a cloud. And seeing this as a feature and not a bug, Wilson realized this would make for an incredibly powerful tool for particle physicists. So in 1911, he produced the first cloud chamber for use in particle physics. And this was a revolutionary device because prior to this, the study of subatomic particles had been somewhat indirect. So for example, when Marie and Pierre Curie were investigating the radioactive emanations of the elements radium and polonium, they did so using a device called an electroscope, which measures electrostatic charge. And when an object is bombarded by radioactive particles, it tends to lose its electrostatic charge. So by exposing the electroscope to a sample of radioactive material and seeing how fast the charge was bled off, they could determine, they get a crude idea of the degree of radiation emanation, the decay rate. 
But with a cloud chamber, you could now visualize the tracks of particles directly. And this opened up a sea of possibilities for experiments. So for example, you could pass a particle through the chamber and expose it to a powerful magnetic field, causing it to curve. And since that curvature depends on the particle's velocity, its mass, and its charge, you could differentiate between different types of particles. You could also witness uh, various rare events such as particle decays or particle collisions. The possibilities were endless. And because of this contribution to the field of particle physics, in 1927, Charles Wilson was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics. And while the specific type of cloud chamber that he invented really isn't used anymore, you'll still hear Wilson's name in the context of a certain type of man-made cloud. So if you've ever seen a rocket launch from Cape Canaveral, you'll know that about 20 seconds into the flight, when it's reaching max Q, maximum dynamic pressure, a cone-shaped white cloud forms over the end of the rocket. You've probably seen these clouds on fighter jets as they fly at transonic speeds in humid air, or in old newsreel footage of atomic tests where this big spherical cloud forms around the fireball. Those are all known as Wilson clouds, and those come about because of the air being expanded in the wake of a shockwave. So as the air expands and cools, the water vapor within it condenses into a cloud. Now, cloud chambers were instrumental in the discovery of a whole host of new subatomic particles, such as the positron in 1932 and the muon in 1936 by Carl Anderson and Seth Neddermeyer, and the kaon in 1947 by George Rochester and Clifford Butler. And this rapid-fire discovery of so many new types of particles really caused something of a stir in the field of particle physics, because it quickly became clear that all these particles couldn't possibly fit into a neat standard model of physics. It became very confusing very quickly. And this is a problem that particle physicists have to deal with to this very day. And they were so annoyed by this development that during his Nobel Prize acceptance speech, the physicist Willis Lamb quipped, the finder of a new elementary particle used to be rewarded by a Nobel Prize, but such a discovery now ought to be punished by a $10,000 fine. So while the Wilson-style cloud chamber was a very powerful tool, it did have its drawbacks, the main one being that it was only sensitive to particles for a very brief window of time. So you really had to time your experiments precisely so that the particle passed through the chamber when it was actually sensitive. And if you were waiting to observe a rare phenomenon such as a particle decay or a collision, then you had to cycle the chamber over and over again or hope that you were extremely lucky and that this event happened while the chamber was sensitive. And this is why in 1936, a physicist named Alexander Langsdorff invented what is known as the diffusion cloud chamber, which is continuously sensitive. And that's the type of cloud chamber that I built in the eighth grade. And let me show you how that works. So this cloud chamber is very simple. It only has a handful of parts. First, there is the wooden base, and this holds a pair of blocks of dry ice. On top of this ice is placed a metal plate. And on top of this, the chamber itself, which is built from an aquarium with a silicone seal around the edge to keep all the gas in. And at the top of the chamber is a felt liner that is soaked in 100% isopropyl alcohol. So as you can see on this particular model, I've covered most of the chamber in black construction paper to shield it from light, except for a hole in the top that acts as an observation port, and a hole in the side for a light to illuminate the interior. And as you can see here, I'm using an old slide projector, which produces a very powerful light, but now we have LEDs, and an LED light would actually be more appropriate for this because it doesn't produce any heat that could disturb the vapor inside the chamber. So how this works is that the alcohol gradually evaporates and the vapor sinks very slowly to the bottom of the chamber. And as it does so, it becomes supercooled, meaning it drops below its ordinary condensation temperature, but doesn't condense. This eventually forms a thin cloud, a layer of supercooled gas just above the plate. And this is our sensitized area that will detect the particles. Now, this supercooled gas is very unstable. It's very sensitive to the slightest disturbance. So when a charged particle passes through the chamber, and it has to be charged, things like neutrons and neutrinos can't be detected in this manner, 
it will ionize the gas along its path, strip off electrons. And this triggers a cascade where the surrounding gas particles quickly condense around the path, forming a track or a cloud. And let me show you some footage from this actual chamber to show you what that looks like. Right, so here we're looking down into the chamber through the top viewing port, and you can see the layer of sensitized supercooled vapor just above the metal plate, and the constant rain of alcohol vapor descending from the top of the chamber. Already we can see several particle tracks every second, and since the chamber is set up away from any major sources of radioactivity, the majority of these tracks will be from cosmic rays. Now, when I filmed this, there was a small leak in the chamber that I wasn't able to plug, and this creates a constant airflow that, as you can see, distorts and dissipates the tracks almost as soon as they form. Now, there are two main types of tracks that we're seeing here. Uh, the big, fat, straight tracks are typically from massive, high-energy particles called muons, which we'll talk about a little later in the video. And here are a few good examples of those. And the second common type of track we see is from lower energy particles like electrons, which are more easily deflected by the particles of gas and form more jagged paths as they ricochet or scatter their way through the chamber. Now, if you want a more reliable and less random source of particles to observe in a cloud chamber, you can introduce a sample of a radioactive element. And this is also fairly easy to obtain because every modern smoke detector contains a small source of americium-241. So americium-241 was discovered by physicist Glenn Seborg and his colleagues during the Manhattan Project as a byproduct of the production of plutonium. And during a nuclear reaction, it is produced when plutonium-239 absorbs two neutrons and then undergoes beta decay. And it was actually the fourth transuranic element, uh, elements beyond uranium on the periodic table, to be discovered. And it is a fairly mild emitter of alpha particles, which makes it safe for use in smoke detectors. And how this works is that the americium-241 source is placed at the base of a little chamber that is exposed to the air, and it ionizes the air inside the chamber, giving it a certain conductivity, and this is measured by a pair of charged plates at either end of the chamber. Now, when smoke particles from a fire enter the chamber, they change this conductivity, and this is detected by the circuit, and it sets off the alarm. So here you can see that I have put this little pellet of emeration in a piece of putty so that it fires the particles sideways, and let's put this inside the chamber and see what we can see. So here you can see the alpha particle track streaming off the radioactive source, and these are very distinctive. They tend to be a little bit fatter, and they travel in straight lines. The track of a beta particle, by contrast, is a lot thinner and also a lot more jagged because it is more easily deflected by the gas particles and just ricochets its way away from the source. And you'll sometimes see a beta track coming off of americium-241 because this is the product of one of the decay products of americium-241, which is palladium-233. So cloud chambers aren't really used anymore in serious research. They're mainly used as classroom demonstration pieces or in science museums. And this is because they were largely replaced in the 1950s by another type of detector called a bubble chamber, which was invented by Donald Glaser in 1952. And bubble chambers work in a very similar fashion to cloud chambers, but instead of using supercooled vapor, they use a pressurized liquid, such as liquid hydrogen, so that when a particle passes through the chamber, it creates a stream of vapor bubbles along its track. 
And these were used for several decades in high energy particle research before they too were replaced by other types of detectors like spark chambers or drift chambers. And these work very much like a Geiger counter where a particle passing through a space between charged plates uh, creates a cascade of electric discharges. And these discharges along the chamber can be tracked by computerized sensors. And today we have mainly solid state silicon sensors that serve much the same purpose. So there's been a considerable evolution in the technology for detecting subatomic particles. So before I end this video, I would like to cover a fascinating and rather mind-bending phenomenon that can easily be observed in a cloud chamber. And this is something called muon decay. So as I mentioned before, the muon is a subatomic particle that was first discovered in 1936. And in nature, muons are mainly produced by the interaction of cosmic rays from outer space with molecules of various gases, such as oxygen and nitrogen, in the upper atmosphere. So when a cosmic ray strikes one of these molecules, it unleashes a shower of particles called pions, which immediately decay into muons. And then muons immediately decay into three different particles, an electron, an electron antineutrino, and a muon neutrino. And you'll recognize these tracks very easily in a cloud chamber because they jog off to one side abruptly. And that's the electron leaving. The other two particles, the neutrino, can't be detected in a cloud chamber. So those form the other two invisible branches of that fork. Now, you're probably wondering, okay, so what? That's cool, but why is that mind-bending? Well, the reason that's mind-bending is because the muon has an extremely short half-life of only 1.56 microseconds meaning that almost as soon as it is produced, it immediately decays. And this should mean that muons you know, shouldn't have enough time to go all the way through the atmosphere and reach the ground where we can observe them. They should all be up in the upper atmosphere where we wouldn't be able to see them. Yet, we detect muon decay on the ground all the time. So, what's going on? Well, weirdly enough, this is one of the best demonstrations of Einsteinian special relativity, and in particular, time dilation. So if you're familiar with special relativity, you'll know that the faster you go, the nearer you are to the speed of light, the slower time passes for you. And this is exactly what is happening with the muon. From its point of view, time is traveling normally. It's decaying in the upper atmosphere. However, from our point of view, it, time is traveling much slower for the muon, meaning that it actually has the time to travel that 100 kilometers or more from the edge of space all the way to the ground where we can observe the decay. So to me, that's absolutely wild because time dilation is not something we typically experience on a human scale. Yes, with things like GPS satellites, we have to take it into account because even a small amount of time dilation can... Uh, result in large errors in location. But, you know, other than near a large gravitational field like a black hole or something like that, we don't experience that degree of time dilation where it's the difference between something decaying in the upper atmosphere and something decaying on the ground. And I just think it's wonderful that with just a couple of dollars worth of materials, you can observe time dilation and Einstein's theories in action. So if you really want a neat experiment to show to your kids or just for yourself, you want to watch particle interactions in the comfort of your own home, definitely go out, purchase a couple dollars worth of materials and build yourself your own cloud chamber. It really is worth the small amount of effort it takes to build one. Anyways, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time on another episode of Cabinet of Curiosities where we'll look at yet more fascinating devices or sometimes scientific instruments just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Have a great day.